you'll open your Bibles to the book of Haggai, we're going to be setting that lesson this morning on building God's house. And that may seem a little strange on a Sunday morning, but as we progress through the lesson, I think you'll see why it's very appropriate for us at this time. Plus, we've been studying Daniel, and so Haggai follows right on the heels of that. Not in your Bible. If you're looking at that book, it's about the third from the last in the Old Testament. Um, but we're familiar with his background because that's what we've been studying in Daniel. The word Haggai means festival of Jehovah. I guess we're having a party with Haggai. You ever wonder why nobody names their children Haggai? You've got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, you've got a few Old Testament names like Isaac or Isaiah. A few Abrahams out there. You never see, have anybody ever met a Haggai? Me neither. I think maybe the name just doesn't sound very pretty. Which is sad because the lesson is very beautiful and that's what we need to keep in mind. Anyway, Haggai was a captive in Babylon and he returned to his homeland under his rubble after King Cyrus uh, let the people go back. He's contemporary with the book of Zechariah and with the prophet Zechariah. And if you'd like to hear lessons on that, let me know. We'll do that in the future. That's another wonderful book that we tend to dodge. But he worked toward rebuilding the temple of Jerusalem, and that was his job, and that was his main mission. If you look at the book of Haggai, it has two chapters and 38 verses, and almost half of those verses contain the statement that Haggai is speaking in the name of the Lord. And so he's calling on God's authority because God is telling Haggai what he wants them to do. And as we progress through the lesson, you'll see what it was. If you go by the time period, you'll see Haggai and Zechariah about the same time period, 520 B.C., which is about 16, 18 years after Cyrus let them go back. The historical settings we pointed out is uh, there was the Babylonian captivity for seven years. We've studied under Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar died in 562 B.C. Babylon, about 16 years after his death or so, or 20 years after his death or so, finally became so weak it was defeated by Cyrus of Persia. And Cyrus is the one that God named prophetically before he was ever king and said, he is the one that's going to let my captive people go back to Jerusalem. Very impressive. He didn't just say a, Bab a, a Persian king. He called him by name. And so Cyrus did exactly that, let all the people return to their native lands and worship their own gods again. And so 538 B.C., 40,000 Jews followed Zerubbabel back, and they began rebuilding the city of Jerusalem, and they laid the foundation of the temple. But here's the problem. They had laid the foundation, were going to build the temple, but the enemies who had been left behind, who thought this land was now theirs, began to complain back to the authorities and say, these people are planning on rebelling against you. They're going to build the temple and the city and the walls, and then they'll rebel against you, so you need to do something about it. So governors stopped the work for a period of time, and then I guess the Jews got busy and forgot what they were supposed to be doing because 16 years later, 520 B.C., they hadn't finished building the temple yet. And so that's the message of Haggai and Zephaniah. Again, you see they're supposed to be building the second temple, and that gives you another time period, and it's very pertinent to our book. Here's another example of where the temple was rebuilt during this time. And Haggai's one idea in the book, there's going to be five points, so be sure you get five points as we leave our sermon today. But the one chief idea is build the temple. Can't miss that one, can you? So if somebody says, what's the book of Haggai about? You say, well, Haggai was commissioned by God to tell the people, get back to building the temple. And you see that repeated over and over again in chapter 1, verses 2 through 9, verse 14, chapter 2 and verse 3, and the verses following, verses 15 through 19. So that was the theme, and that was God's message. And Israel listened to Haggai and to God, and the temple was finished in a four-year period. Lay the foundations and let it go for 16 years, and then when God said rebuild it and the people listened, they did it in four years. So here's the lesson we want to gain from the book of Haggai. And the number one is put God first in your life. 
because that's what they had neglected to do as they were returning back. And if you'll read along with me, beginning at verse 1, it says, In the second year of Darius, King, uh, King Darius, in the sixth month of the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, Jehozadak the high priest. Now those two names, Joshua and Zerubbabel, here are men who are spiritually minded, they are leaders of the people, and it takes two men to get this job started, but they needed some encouragement. God said, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, This people says the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. And he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in and be glorified, says Jehovah. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why? Because my house is in ruins while every one of you runs to his own house. Therefore the heavens above you withhold the dew and the earth withholds its fruit. For I have called for a drought on the land and the mountains and on grain and new wine and oil on whatever the ground brings forth, on men and livestock and all the labors of your hands. So you see what the problem is. Well, it's not time to build the temple. We started that and it caused trouble, so we'll just get to that eventually. Well, they're building not just houses, but paneled houses. They're in luxury homes. And God says, I'm totally disgusted that you're putting yourselves first to that degree while my house, my temple, lies in ruins. And so he said, I brought all these curses upon you and the nation because you're not putting me first in your life. You're not building the temple like you should have done. So a powerful message, you can see the first application. How many times we can look at ourselves and say, you know, I don't put God first in my life either. I love God, I serve God, I believe in God, I read the Bible occasionally, but I don't put Him first. And there's a big difference between believing in God and serving God by putting Him first. And we see that with these people. They hadn't denied God. They weren't rejecting the importance of the temple. They just got busy with their own, if you'll pardon the expression, rat killing, and didn't get back to doing the work of the Lord. <clears throat> so Matthew 6.33 is still there. But seek first. What place? First. Not just in time, but in priority. If you're setting priorities, what comes first? The kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then all these material things will be added to you. That's what Haggai is is being told from God. You know, you guys go go to work, but if you bring your money home, it falls through bags. You eat, you don't have enough. You work harder, you get less. What's the problem? You haven't put me first. You think God's not paying attention? You think maybe that's part of our problem as Christians? We say, well, the country's gone to pot. It's immoral. It doesn't serve God. It doesn't reverence Him. Okay, I agree. But where are we going to start with the spiritual revival in America? i got news for you. Us. You. Me. Oh, but I'm just one person. So was Joshua and so was Zerubbabel. And they revived the nation and turned this whole thing around and rebuilt the temple in four years. So you and I have got to be the place to begin. We're the light of the world. We're the city set on the hill. It's time for us to get out and speak up and say, if you want to solve America's problems, love God with all your heart, love your neighbors yourself, and go worship God by putting Him first in your life. Is that right? Shake or nod, wink or blink. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Colossians 1.18, Paul said, He is the head of the body. Now notice the priority in this list. Where does Jesus Christ fit in? He's the head of the church. He's the beginning. He's the third born from the dead. What, second born? First born from the dead. That in all things he may have the preeminence. 
What he's saying is he's first in the church. He's first in creation. He's first born from the dead and never to die again. And therefore, he wants first place in everyone's life because he will not accept second place if we don't, give it, if we don't put, first, put him first in our lives. And guess what? God knows. He knows what we think about him. He knows whether we've used our opportunities as we should. He knows whether some people are taking advantage of this COVID thing to kind of just forget about God for a while. I'm on vacation from the Lord. Well, I hope not in this case. But that's the first thing we see that God's people were neglecting is they weren't building the temple like they should. And so let's be sure we put God first in our lives and not second. Israel's first fruits, look at Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 6 through 11, where God blessed them as they brought them out of Egyptian captivity. And it says in this passage, He has brought us to this place, which is the promised land, and given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, watch this, I have brought forth the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have given me. God required Israel when they came into the promised land and had their very first harvest to give all the best of the first fruits to God. And so that's what they did and that tells us I trust in God for my daily necessities. I trust in God for my spiritual well-being. I trust in God to take care of my health and I trust in God for my financial situation. That's really what the first fruits are all about. And you can see the logic of that, can't you? I mean, what if God said, you guys fill your barns full until they're just running over, and then whatever you've got left over, you give to me. Who would we be trusting if we did that? Why, look at my big barn. Look how much I harvested. Look how much I've got. But God said to these people, your barns are empty. Your fields are just now being harvested. You may want to eat the first fruits, but you give that to me, and then I'll promise you that you'll be taken care of the rest of the way. So it's an act of faith. And that shows also that God wants to be first. So question number one, is he first in your life? Not your family, not your job, not your bank account, not your education. Put Jesus Christ on the throne of your heart. And we all did that when we obeyed the gospel, but we need to be reminded from time to time that if we've shoved him off the throne and put ourselves, our money, or whatever on that, then let's get our priorities back in order. Number two, nobody can truly prosper if the Lord is not first in their hearts. And that's what Haggai is telling these people. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of your increase. Jeremiah 2 and verse 3 says, The first fruits of his increase is Israel. And so how does man give God the leftovers and think he will be pleased? So Matthew 16, 24 through 26. Put him first in your life. That's lesson number one. But put him first in your heart. That's lesson number two. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him what? Deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to, watch this. There's an application here for us right now. For he who desires to save his life will lose it. You think God can't afflict you if he wants to? You think God can't pick you out and say, you know, you're not doing what you should. I could just strike you dead. I could afflict you with a disease worse than the COVID-19. I can do a lot of things if I want to. Because he said, when you try to save your life, you're going to die anyway. We're all dying. It's just a matter of when, not if. And if you die and you haven't saved your soul, then you've lost everything. That's what he means. He who desires to save his life will lose it. You can't win that proposition. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? So we have to say, do I want to choose earth life or do I want to choose eternal life? Because in this scenario, you can't have both on number one. And So if you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, then he'll be number one and you'll be seeking to save your life eternally. And so the order is deny yourself. In our country, we're told to promote ourselves. But that's always been the case. 
Take up your cross. What was Jesus' cross? His cross was to die on the cross for the sins of the world. What's the cross you're supposed to bear? Somebody says, well, my health is kind of breaking down, so that's my cross I've got to bear. No, that's a personal cross, and that's not what he's talking about. Cross in this context is your spiritual responsibility that you personally practice to show that you love God and that you put him first. That's what that is. A lot of examples of that. And then he said, follow me. And that's what we should do. And that's what we want to do. And we see the example of the Jews in uh, Haggai's day because they built the temple. They got back on the program and in four years had it built. But when the churches of Christ in the first century were collecting funds in order to give money to the poor saints in Jerusalem, and there was a spiritual lesson as well as a physical lesson. There was a famine in Judea, so the brethren were starving. They had used all of their money in Acts 2, you remember, sold lands and houses and gave to the apostles so that people from all over the world who came and became Christians could stay there longer and learn what it means to be a Christian. But now they're poverty-stricken. So Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, goes to all these Gentile churches all over Asia Minor. And he says, now I'm going to take up a collection from you Gentile Christians. I'm going to give it back to the Judean churches who are Jewish Christians. And in doing so, we're going to bind together both Jew and Gentile as one. So there's a spiritual purpose, but there's also a need. They are needing your money so they can buy food and clothing. And so the church has all contributed, and Paul was one of the uh, men who promoted that, and he had several men who were the messengers to carry that money back, and they did a fantastic job the first century. But here's what's interesting. The churches of Macedonia were not in a very good situation to help. That would be Philippi and churches like that. So in 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4, Paul uses them as an example to Corinth. Because he said, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the church of Macedonia that in a great trial of affliction, circumstances aren't that good. They're not having a great time, they're being afflicted. But in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep, what? Poverty. Okay, Macedonia, you churches are excused because you're worse off than the people down there in Judea. He said, do you think you're going to leave us out? you got another thing coming. We're not going to be left out. We may be poor. We may be afflicted. But, you know, outward circumstances don't determine your attitude or your love for God. Outward circumstances just give you the opportunity to react one way or the other. And it says in their deep poverty, they themselves first gave themselves to the Lord, then to us by the will of God. And so what did they do? Because of their great joy in helping those others, it says, I bear witness that according to their ability and, yes, beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. I bet you it wasn't that much money. It might have been more than the widow's two mites. But it's the same spirit. We're in affliction. We're poverty stricken, but if you're going to give money to show the Gentile support of the Jewish brethren so that we can all be one in Christ Jesus, then don't pass us by. And Paul almost uses this to shame the church of Corinth because they're kind of dragging their feet. Do you see how the beautiful passage and example is here? And we need to appreciate that and say, you know, we can do better than we have and stop feeling sorry for ourselves. So, how do we build? Well, in Haggai chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, God said, and again in chapter 2, we're not reading all of this, but as they're building the temple, obviously from the context of chapter 2, the temple doesn't look quite like it did in Solomon's day. Solomon built a glorious temple. You remember how wealthy he was? Silver were like stones in Israel at his time. Money was just coming in by the pickup loads. And besides that... When God told King David, his father, you can't build the temple. Your son's going to do that. You have blood in your hands. Well, David spent the rest of his life collecting all the materials so that when Solomon could build the temple, they'd be right there. 
So Solomon built a glorious temple that dedicated it with thousands and thousands of animal sacrifices. Solomon prayed to God and said, When anyone looks to this temple and prays, God hear their prayer. And it was a great and beautiful ceremony at the zenith of Israel's existence. And now these poor captives have come back who hardly have two nickels to rub between their fingers and the nation is not doing very well yet. They've got to grow from somewhere. And they start laying the foundation. They start building the temple. And you just can't help but think, man, this just is not going to be what we're used to. And so God gives this message right while they're thinking that. And he says, yet now be strong, Zerubbabel. He's the leader. And be strong, Joshua, the other leader, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains with you. Do not fear. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth. The sea and dry land, I will shake all nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. Now, what do you do when you find an obstacle that seems like it's impossible to overcome? He said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. He said, realize that I am with you whether the temple is a beautiful Solomonic temple or whether it's a little bitty temple just getting started. The building isn't what's important, it's what's in the heart. And he said, my spirit remains with you throughout the building of this temple even though in your lifetime it's not going to be what you would like for it to be. By the time Jesus came to the earth, that temple was glorious again, but they'd spent all those years building the temple And even King Herod had spent, I think, 46 years, wasn't it, Tim? Building the temple on further. And so by the time of Christ, it was a glorious temple. You know, that's another question we can ask ourselves. Can you worship God in the building that's functional like this, but not gold-lined? Don't have a pipe organ that reaches to the ceiling. Don't have 2,000 people here. We don't have Starbucks in the back. You can get that while you come in. You know, some churches do. they got all that stuff. Or could you worship God better in a, in a building like this? And the answer to that is it depends on what you're impressed by. And the reason why we don't have a gold ornate building is because God is spirit. And he's not impressed with physical things because he doesn't need gold or silver or any of that. You and I are impressed with that because we're mortal human beings who like nice things. But then we have to ask ourselves, am I here to impress God or myself? Now, if we built a beautiful big building because it was needed to fill up all the people that came, that'd be okay. But the Lord's people have never been so obsessed with the building itself that we emphasize that over the people who are in it. But, you know, that's the same exact thing that God tells us in the New Testament. Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. How do you be strong in the Lord? You believe his word and you get up and you get busy doing what he needs you to do. Matthew 28.20, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. And lo, I will be with you always, even to the end of the world. Do you know that Christ is with you and with me and he's with this church if we're doing what we should do? And so now it is time to build the house of the Lord, not by brick and mortar, but by saving the souls of those out there in America who are lost because, man, are they lost. They don't know what right or wrong is or why it should be or how to love others. Do you know that you can't protest somebody to love somebody else? Maybe we need to protest let everybody to know we're not doing it right. That's fine. But you're still going to have to teach people to love your neighbor like yourself. And you can only do that if you teach them to love God who, in whose image we're made. And if they love their neighbor just to be loving the neighbor, that's not, that's not the reason. If we aren't made in the image of God, then we might as well treat our neighbor like we treat a cow, have it for hamburger meat. But if man is made in God's image and we're to love God, then we're to love those who are made in his image. And that makes perfect sense, and that's the best motivation of all. Right? Shake or nod, wink or blink. 
I need some support here. If you don't believe that, let me know why you don't. But Jesus said, I'll be with you always, even in the world, if you observe all things I've commanded you. In Matthew 26, 29, Jesus said, I will no longer eat of this fruit of the vine, eat and drink of this bread and fruit of the vine until I eat it and anew with you where? In my Father's kingdom. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, where is Jesus? He's right here with us. When those poor people coming back from 70 years captivity are trying to build their houses and their farms and their fields and all the things that are important to them. And there's that temple ground with grass growing up between it. And he says, you know, take care of first things first. You get God's house built up and then everything else will take care of itself. And if you don't put God's house first, and I'll say to it, you don't do well. God can do that. He has the right because he's the creator. He's the one who so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. He's done everything for us. We can do our part for him. And so there it is, the same thing. Be strong, be courageous, realize that I'm in your midst and I will be with you always as long as you do what's right. And then the fourth lesson we learn from this book is be sure your heart is clean. Because in chapter 2 and verses 10 through 14, a third revelation comes to Haggai. And this is all in a very short period of time, just a matter of months. It says, Then Haggai answered and said, So is this people and so is this nation before me, says the Lord, and so is every work of their hands, and what they offer there is unclean. Let's back up and see how God pointed out something. Not only were they not putting God first in their lives by building the temple second, not only was God not in their hearts because they had enthroned themselves a little bit too much, and not only had they not done the things that they needed to do to be strong and courageous, but here in Haggai chapter 2, God illustrates it. He says in verse 10, On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts. Now ask the priest concerning the law, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If one carries holy meat in the fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread or stew, wine or oil or any food, will it become holy? He said, No, it won't be. It's not holy. And Haggai said, if one who is unclean because of a dead body touches any of these, will it be unclean? Well, of course it will be unclean. That's what the law of Moses taught. So in other words, you take something holy and you touch that which is unclean, the holy thing becomes unclean as well. And then here's his application. So is this people and so is this nation before me. You guys are unclean because you never repented and asked God to forgive you and offered the sacrifice to wash away your sins. And so everything you're touching, which happens to be your home, your houses, your fields, and especially the Lord's temple, it's all unclean. Now how could you tell that by looking? You could. You just know what the rules are. You know that God's paying attention. and God says, you guys aren't doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're offering unclean sacrifice. You're offering an unclean temple. We've got to clean this mess up. And so that was the lesson. Be sure you get your heart right with God. True outward worship cannot be offered by people who have tainted hearts. James chapter 4 teaches us that when it says in verse 1 to Christians. And by the way, James was the half-brother of the Lord and fully Jewish. And so he's talking primarily to Jewish brethren, but it applies to everybody in every generation. And he says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? So what's he saying? You guys are a little bit too carnally minded. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. Well, I don't need God. I can build it myself. No, that's not true. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Would it be all right to say, Lord, my mansion isn't quite big enough and I need a gold-tinted car. 
And by the way, while you're giving me stuff, go ahead and fill up my bank account. It's getting a little low. And then I'll go out and spend it all on myself. That's what they're doing. Very selfish, self-centered, carnal, not spiritually minded at all. So he says in verse 4, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So we're back to that same question we started out with on point number one. Deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. Deny yourself simply means put God on the throne and then God will take care of you. But you'll be at least number two if not farther down than that. But the priority is to be where they should be. And here he says, if you want to go along with the world and all their sinful pleasures and ideas and theories and doctrines, then you go right ahead, but you are an adulterer or adulteress in my mind because as a child of God, as a group of Christians, we're the bride of Christ. And we're to love Christ and to put him first and to honor and magnify him. And if we're out serving these things of the world, then we're adulterers and adulteresses in a spiritual sense. And again, God knows the heart. And so we have to be sure our heart is clean too. And the last point is that obedience leads to a glorious future. You go back to Haggai and you'll see that God said in chapter 2, verses 20 through 23, that the day is coming when this temple and the fulfillment of all the things it stands for is going to be just what it should be. Again, the word of the Lord came to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah saying, I will shake heaven and earth. I will overthrow the throne of kingdoms. I will destroy the strength of the Gentile kingdoms. I will overthrow the chariots and those who ride in them. The horses and their riders shall come down, every one by the sword of his brother. In that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, my servant, the son of Shealtiel, says the Lord, and will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Now, what's he talking about here? God says, I'm going to destroy all these Gentile nations, and I'm going to destroy the nation of Israel. Well, from Haggai until the end of the history that we're talking about, look what happened. Persia fell. Greece became a mighty force. We still talk about Alexander the Great to this day, but he fell. Then Rome came in and took their place and became a mighty worldwide empire. But all of that was just to accomplish God's purpose. The Pax Romana was so that the gospel could be spread throughout the entire world through the Roman Empire and all of its uh, protective uh, laws and rules for citizens and also to unify the empire long enough to let the gospel be spread free throughout the entire world. And Paul said in Colossians 1, it's been preached to every creature under heaven. So it did its purpose, but then Rome fell. Well, when Jesus built the church and the church established the day of Pentecost, the kingdom of Israel physically is no longer needed, and within 30 more years, it is destroyed and never to rise again. But guess what's still standing? Here we are 2,000 years later. The King of kings and the Lord of lords reigning over his spiritual kingdom, the church. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. It begins in the heart. It translates into our lives. Our mouths speak the convictions that we believe with all of our heart. If you'll serve Jesus Christ and honor and love him, then all the problems of the world will be solved. But we have to believe it first ourselves to make it a reality. But now turn to Hebrews chapter 12 because the day that Haggai was prophesying, which is another 400 years away, not something like that, is now a reality and has been for 2,000 years. What Haggai prophesied, God made come to pass. And so what are we waiting for? We can't wait for a better covenant. We already have it, Hebrews 7. We don't need a better promise. We have the promise of eternal life through Jesus Christ. We don't look for a better sacrifice. The Son of God shed His blood on the cross. We don't need a better agreement because everyone who wants to go to heaven can through the gospel because God's grace is so extensive that if you sin, you repent, and the blood of Christ wash your sins away. Just like when God said, this temple may not look very good to you guys, but it looks beautiful to me. You let God, the spirit of all beings, worry about the spirit side. You just take care of the physical work. 
And so God says, maybe my kingdom in the eyes of men seems small and little, but in my eyes, precious in the sight of the Lord is every one of his saints. That's what Jesus meant when he said, what's more important, the whole world or one soul? What does man profit that gains the whole world and loses his soul? Your soul is eternal, the world is temporary. So John said, do not love the world, neither things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, are not of the Father, but of the world. And the world, what? Passes away in the lust thereof. But he who does the will of the Lord shall abide forever. That goes past death, folks. Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So when we die, we don't lose it all, we gain it all. The people of this world, when they die, they lose it all. I remember my father used to say about a man who said, well, if I can't take my riches with me, then I'm not going. But dad said, but he did. And that's the truth. If you don't believe what God's word is saying today, one second after death, you'll believe every word of it. But that won't help your soul then, so you need to take care of that now. But back to Hebrews 12, 28. You're probably familiar with the passage. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be what? Shaken. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. God's kingdom cannot be moved. Babylon was moved. Medo-Persia was moved. Greece was moved, Rome was moved, and every kingdom since then, including America, one day will be moved. But the kingdom of God will never be moved. But look in your Bibles to Hebrews 12 and notice how the Hebrew writer connects Haggai with this truth. Back in Hebrews chapter 12, it says this. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. Verse 26, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not only the earth, but also heaven. Now this yet once more indicates the removal of those things that are being shaken, as of things that are made, that the things which cannot be shaken may remain to the Hebrew writer what that is saying is the nation of Israel is about to be destroyed it's an earthly kingdom God has turned its back on it because the nation crucified Jesus Christ the son of God and as Jesus himself saw the rejection of the nation of him he sat over the city of Jerusalem and cried oh Jerusalem Jerusalem you who kill the prophets and stone those who are sent to you. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under your wing, but you would not. Now listen. The next words were, Behold, your house is left to you desolate. When they killed Jesus, God killed the nation. And yet for a few more years it stood but by the time the Hebrew letter is being written, it's a matter of months or maybe a few short years. And God says, yet one more time, I will shake not only the earth, that's the Gentile nations, but also heaven, which is Israel, God's former beloved nation. And he said, I'm taking all these earthly things away because they can be shaken, that the one thing that cannot be shaken, the spiritual kingdom of God may stand. And if they didn't understand that, then they would miss a beautiful message. And so therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which, which cannot be shaken, let us do what God has taught the people of Haggai's day. Put God first in your life. Put God first in your heart. Clean your soul up by repentance, confession, and if need be, baptism. And then rule with Jesus Christ in the spiritual kingdom forevermore. So where do I begin? Well, just like we said, Give yourself first to the Lord and everything else takes its place. And give your service to the Lord because that's what he wants. Thank you for listening to our lesson today and I hope it means as much to you as it does to me.
because we need a people who are zealous for the Lord, a nation that can be turned back to God again, but it begins with us. You be the light of the world where you are. You be a city set on a hill that cannot be moved. You tell everybody you're part of an eternal kingdom that has been around for 2,000 years and will be around till the end of the world. And if you want to be a citizen of that kingdom where it's a kingdom of love for God, love for your neighbor, forgiveness and acceptance of those who have done wrong, God is abundantly willing to forgive if only we'll put him first in our lives, humble ourselves and obey his will and be what God would have us to be.